Hello, Nick. Hello, Nick. This is a, this is a cardstock recording specifically for Nick, who said, "I can't make it." Are you recording it? Oh, yes, we are. It is a cardstock. Uh, cardstock New Year. Happy New Year, cardstock people. Everybody wave on cue. Wave. Happy New Year. Hi. Two waves. Two waves. Two or waves. We could, we could do the. Maybe we can do a, an actual wave there, starting from somewhere. Everybody's got different order on the screen. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I've not met Stephen Anderson before. Hello. Uh, Hello. Just noticing. Hi. Just thought I'd say hi. It's like new, new, new face. But maybe, um, maybe the rest of the gents have seen you in previous card stocks. Stephen definitely has been in two card stocks a while ago, maybe. A while ago, yeah. The six or seven a.m. for me time was pretty challenging. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I, I, I made a couple because I, I, I've only met Rena. Nick at one card stock and John not much more than that. Or well, do you all know each other well? Yeah. Well, you know what? How about Chris? Tell us about yourself. Oh God. <laughs> oh, no. oh, that's uh, that, that's. Uh, I'll I'll, I'll, I'll change the cue. I'll change the cue. How about um? Let's see. That's quite a fun thing to do. Your favorite well, book. Oh, Give yeah, us favorite a favorite book. book. Just to say, like, hi, I'm Chris, and I love this book. A book. Uh, How Buildings Learn by Stuart Brand. Uh, mm. Oh, so there we go. I'll, I'll launch off. That was that was an easy one. Um, yeah, you know your and audience. I'm, I, and, and 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 as Rena asked us to sort of say hi, I'm uh, I'm an architect by background. Um, done spent the last ten years or so mostly designing performance spaces, places where leaning towards places where people gather, designing the systems with via which people gather quite into the ideas of um, the systemization of, of what has been treated by my profession as being some kind of God-given craft, uh, or God, not God-given craft, God-given uh, talent. And um, I teach a bit at uni and um, uh, there, that's my, yeah, no one's had a chance. But now books, everyone. <laughs> books. Well, Rina, what's your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book. I am going to go with, ta -da -da, unconventionally, um, a book of poems by Liz Lockhead, Scottish poet, called um, Franken um, Frankenstein's and Dreams. It's a collection of her poetry, and it's subverting fairy tales. So, for example, one of the favorite poems I have there um, is called Rapunstiltskin. So he's, she rather, mesh meshing Rapunzel and Rumpelstiltskin. And then, um, yeah, kind of having modern tales about fairy tales, but yeah, life changing. Liz Lockhead, book of poems. Ah, speaking of Scottish women, Scottish. <laughs> just on cue, Lisa's just signed on, so I might tag her. Lisa, we're doing introductions. Chris, um, Daniel, who has just like mentioned, it, and we we're using like a book angle to just do intros. And um, I just talked about Liz Lockhead being a favorite poet of mine and she's Scottish in a book and then you popped up just after I finished and you're on and mute you're, um, yeah. <laughs> your sound needs some tweaking yep that'll do it voila we hear you loud and clear all I needed to do was press the damn button <laughs> sorry so you're doing introductions has everyone been um, because Chris hasn't met everyone yet, so Chris started. I kind of kicked oh, up a little bit. I was being selfish, wanting to. And then, yeah, not at all. And Rena so didn't know Stephen either. So mm, let's have a bit, just of, met a, a bit from Liesl and a bit from Stephen, and then we'll go. A book? Okay, can oh, Stephen go first? Okay, right. Stephen can go uh, first. Please, uh, thank you. The Little Prince would be, be my pick. My pick. It's just... So beautiful, so simple, so elegant, you know, for children and for adults. So that, that would be my pick. Uh, I'm dialing in from the States uh, in a suburb just north of Dallas, Texas. And uh, yeah, John and I met years ago at UX London, I believe. We were both yeah. speakers and uh, we sat next to each other at the speaker dinner and found out we had a shared passion for cards and card design. Um, going back a decade or more, I published... Uh, a card deck called the Mental Notes card deck. And then I've, in various workshops and things I've facilitated, I've created other card decks and tiles and toolkits and things. And so 
I have a love for um, giving form to ideas that people can manipulate and play with. And Steve and cool. Steve and I have just started hatching a little um, <laughs> ear table thing, which I might show later, um, just because we were sort of like having an email conversation about it. Um, but that's for later. Maybe that's for the end. Liesl, have you a book yet? I'll have. I give you a book. I'll give you a recent book which um, struck me, which was Luck and Both by Jenny Fagan, another Scottish writer. She's also a poet and an artist. Um, she did a, a residency at, um, um, gosh, what's the place at the Edinburgh Festival? Um, Chris, what's the place at the Edinburgh Festival where they had the... A summer hall. She did a residence at Summer Hall and she did a thing with bones. She's quite dark. She's quite gothic, which is rather suited to Edinburgh um, because Ed Edinburgh is a, a, a grand old dame of European capitals, um, but it's very gothic in nature. And Luckenbooth tells the story of one building, Luckenbooth Close, and it has um, each decade for a century during the last century, the occupants of this particular building and the narrative structure shouldn't work but it does and it's brilliant you really feel that you're taken back to each decade of of the last century in Edinburgh and you meet all sorts of characters and so I think Luck and Booth is good for people who like things which are great stories but also a little bit on the dark side and also um you get to meet loads of different characters and lots of different things happen. So it's very full, kind of like a, a mini Gorman gas, if you like, by Mervyn Peak. Um, it's that sort of thing. So um, I recommend that as a, as, a, as a representation of the way I'm thinking at the moment. Delightful. <clears throat> the, I'm gonna go and have a look for that afterwards. Um, the, so notionally, um, we did have a little game to play today where people were going either going to bring a card that they have or drawn or a deck that they think will be important to them for 2022. I can't believe I'm saying the words 2022. That seems weird. It's all March 2020, isn't it? Um, so... Da, 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 da. By the way, John, I'm witnessing the uh, sudden new angle from today. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. So the, I've moved did, the yeah. office around, so it used to be like, against yeah. the door, but now we needed more space just to sort of look with, with double desks and running back and forth and through and so on so it's kind of like it's been a bit a bit of a moving out I am I'm one of these people that might write a blog post about moving my office around but then go no. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <don't> <laughs> write a blog post. you've done a video and you're just an edit I know you will sure. yeah and this is uh, yeah six hour video how office is um, <laughs> so um, the, I Right, Wait a I'm second, a... that was a 1970s book on which how buildings were learned, wasn't it? Isn't that uh, by DGW? <laughs> it's the, yeah, quite. Um, the, so, um, does anybody want to go first with their, well, Rina, you held yours up there, you have yours to hand. Awesome. So, well, Rina. because it was, um, hi. So, um, my deck, um, I didn't realise it was a deck, I thought it was a book, but I spotted it before somewhere in my visual radar. And um, it was in a vision board because I, I do vision boards. And um, there is a bookstore, speaking of books, uh, the oldest esoteric bookstore in London is Watkins Bookstore, which is on Cecil Street near Leicester Square. And I was having a gander there. Uh, when was it? I don't know, somewhere around Christmas, you know, shopping for Christmas presents. And I didn't realize that there's such a thing called the Synchronicity Oracle is actually a deck. I thought it was a book, but it's a a card deck and it is <laughs> hexagonal ah! <laughs> it's like i don't know obviously i mean from the pattern right it's, it's a hexagonal deck and it is made by what's the name of this dude again his name is etan ilfield he is the owner of the shop um so he's most likely i don't know you know i mean i i love the bookstore um, but also, I guess, uh, yeah, I never really met Eitan Ilfield, but he would probably be a master or student of different symbolic meanings. So he had, this is his deck, right? The owner of the oldest esoteric bookstore made a deck. And it is, so what happens is I think you do it like in a, a, a sequence and it's kind of, he, so what he's digging, it's like double. 
So I'm going to do, uh, let's just do an, an example. Kind of like, does anybody know what double is? D O double D L E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great game. With kids, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's how it starts. So you pick first card. Um, and so this is for um, us together. And then what's the next one? All right, quick, quick game. What's the common denominator? Oh, I can't even see it. Which one is it? Oh, it's the sort of thing that looks like a, a, a magnifying glass. I'm not sure what it is. The mirror. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, anyway. So, yeah, and then whatever the mirror might mean for all of you here. I, I'm of the inclination that it's not, I don't rely on the book. Or it's, just, it's more like, it's more the, the holder or the viewer. So whatever you interpret what that might be for you. So the mirror. So how it goes then is that you pick these two. And then you pick another two. So it's a bit of, and then like here, and then you get like um, six and then a seventh one in the middle. And then you have to do like connect the, the link from, so obviously the two mirrors here. And then when I get another card here, there would be two other common denominators, then two other, and then the middle hex right here would have each, and it's, it's, it's quite spectacular. So each, like there is a, a thread so it's a bit more complex compared to other Oracle cards, which is just like the one thing or maybe a couple of things. So this has more complexity. And I think that 2022 for me means leveling up and being able to handle these kind of, uh, I don't know, tessellations. So yeah, very interesting. And um, I've tested it already, obviously, and it's produced some uncanny results. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, and that playful thing. It's really strange as well where even though it's there, I still have to, you know, really look and like, where the fuck is the cold thing? And it's yeah, staring yeah. you in the face and you still can't tell. Oh, there it is after like, uh, like rearranging like yeah. double. So, yeah. Yeah. There's been many occasions playing double where I've been convinced that there isn't the, the, the there isn't a matching thing. I love the, the the maths behind, though, being able to have a deck of however many cards and making sure that there's a matching pair on each. Yeah, so it's kind of, again, like this is what the spread is suggested to look like, right? Mm. So it's more like a flower. So I thought, very interesting. And I had not gone out of my way. So as with, we were talking about books, right? With books and with certain objects in magical collective places, there's a sense that it calls you. It just like whispers like, psst, oh, pick me up. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and, by, and, and this one kind of like screamed so that's me i'll put a, the thing on the on the deck i'm gonna go hmm, tag matt we haven't seen you in a while so how about you yeah okay i've got um there's a, a set of cards i've been playing around with for years now um which was the first thing i did in cards which are priority cards and it they're really tedious and they're not very pretty um but they're, they're useful and they're basically groups of things that might be on the mind of a particular type of person. So it started off with a set of cards that represented things that a CIO chief information officer might be thinking of. And then I've created a set of 50 cards based on knowledge and being a judge of a CIO awards and various things. And then I did a CMO one with Matt Desmier, the guy who organized Silicon Beach, and then I did a uh, HR one with somebody who runs an HR community, and I got a group of HR people in the room and got them to talk about what should be on the priorities for an HR director at any given time, and they came up with a really boring list of stuff. So we then had to rework it a bit to make it a bit more exciting. Um, and then I did a, one which was about um, data which was for a client, which was a company called Domo, who creates software to enable people to do software visualizations, uh, data, sorry, visualizations. Um, and then there was another set, which is about information security, which I did with Phil Huggins, who's somebody that Nick uh, and both know. Um, and then anyway, I, I got contacted by somebody I know who works for Zoom, and Zoom are an interesting position, as one wouldn't have to mm. make huge leaps uh, to get to which is that they had this burst of activity about two years ago when they suddenly became super popular and then everybody realized that they could probably do most of it in microsoft teams so they're now in a position where the salespeople at zoom are starting to have a really really hard time after having this kind of 
glory days of about 18 months where everybody thought, yeah. Um, so they've, um, somebody I know at Zoom in the UK has come to me and said, how might we ever do? So anyway, um, what I've done is um, to create a new set of priority cards, which are the hybrid working priority cards, seeing as that seems to be a thing. So that I've, I'll share this with people because it'd be interesting to get feedback from people. So they're very... This Have you is got half like of them really... there with you and half of them are elsewhere? Yeah, exactly. Now, all of them are digital because that it becomes the, the thing, doesn't it, when you're having to... You have to go down to the lowest common denominator of access when you're working hybrid. Or maybe not. But anyway, so there's... I don't know, there's 50-something of these at the moment. And the idea with these is um, this isn't... a uh, uh, what an organization should do to be able to be good at hybrid mm -hmm. working but what it is the idea behind it is here's a bunch of external prompts the original idea got prompted for me by having a set of um, oblique strategy cards and then thinking how could i make that relevant to a somebody who's a senior it leader because they're going to really freak out with oblique strategies so it's just sort of random input into things that enable you to play mostly sorting games priority and and, and um, prioritize stacking games so you can say to people okay so you're saying you want to do this thing about hybrid working so what are these things you're looking at, at the moment which of them do you think are relevant to your organization which ones do you think are, you don't even understand which are the ones that you think you've done already which are the ones that you think you probably need to work more on which ones are causing you problems and you just move them around the table with stuff but if i found it's just a good way of being able to externalize. I mean, this is one of the things about this sort of card deck generally is um, it externalizes ideas. So people have something to point at and move rather than trying to be able to just deal with concepts in the head. And when you're in a group setting, whether that's physically with bits of cardboard or even actually, I found that using Miro uh, can be as, as helpful. I wish there was a, a shuffle feature in Miro because if you could just pull all these together and do that and then just okay I'll stick them back together again I can do that but it, it always keeps the order the same sadly um but anyway so that's the thing I'm working on at the moment and I don't know I think it looks like it could be quite useful as a tool and so I'll work out what to do with it so that's me two, two things quickly and me so the one on the shuffle thing that feels like exactly the thing that whenever we looked at Deck Hive um, yeah. and then Nick's working on Deckable and yeah, yeah. other things and so on. Every time I see one, I go, yeah, but there's a, this is a Miro plugin, right? This is a kind of sort of, I don't want to go to that environment to always do everything. I just want to be able to bring that no. environment and those that functionality onto the general board. It's like, I mean, if you were to kind of like put it in the physical space, you could sort of like, sure, I want I want to buy your card deck, but I don't want to buy your specific kitchen table that I have to play it on. I'd just rather use it on the kitchen table I have. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then the, the, sec the second thing is this guy called Martin Roberts, who sort of used artifact cards really, really early, and he drew some lovely ones, um, and he was a risk assessor. But what he used to do is get a selection of things like this and say, right, here is your typical risk profile for an airline or security, an airport, whatever else, etc. Pull the ones that you have sorted closer to you and push the <clears> ones <throat> that you're a bit unsure about further away from you. And then he would use blank artifact cards in between to build a ladder of what the next steps were. Um because then what then then what you'd have is sort of like you'd have sort of like okay so we need to get this under control so therefore the things that we should do next are this then this then this then this um, and that would be a nice a nice exercise to try after the sorting. Yeah, there's also the um, I have done and I think I've shown it on here before. There's a thing called PlayCards.io, which actually is is much more of a simulation of a table with playing cards on it. And you can do all the sorting and shuffling, but again, this is the point unless you can embed it in a place where you can do other work it's a bit nah. it's a technical term a bit anyway i just um shared a link to a, a game called a, 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 it's only on steam it's a proper sort of board game it's called tabletop simulator yeah. <clears throat> and uh maybe it's come up here before but until you were saying that about shuffling it hadn't occurred to me that 
So I know people who during the pandemic, in order to play massively complicated board games uh, online instead of with their mates, started doing it. But it's just um, the problem is you'd have to get everyone to sign up for that. You could you could build some very complex. You could build entire meeting simulations in there. Be quite amusing. That gets me onto my other subject about my ongoing project. It's a satirical project, which is called Meetingly.io, which is about being able to create avatars that simulate meetings for us. So we can just send our avatar into the meeting and eventually everybody will just send their own avatars to be able to have the meetings and we can just focus on other things instead. I thought, this is, this, there with the I thought this is what it was. This is my avatar. I will get me in a minute. That explains a lot, John. It, isn't it that whole thing with uh, there's a meme that goes around about having a meeting where everyone's got a red button under the table where once a certain number of press and the meeting just automatically ends um, you know that, yeah I did think about doing a procurement exercise recently as well which we'd had to do all online and uh, bringing in the um, the mechanic from the, the TV show The Voice where we'd all basically sit facing backwards with our backs to the camera and only start to turn around if there was something that got us interested. I think that'd be such a good test of how good a potential <laughs> <John. supplier> was. <laughs> yeah. 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 FYI, I will not agree to a metaverse meet of cardstock, okay? Just putting out there, no. <laughs> it's like, not going to happen. <laughs> Um, the, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to pick up your metaverse cue then and say uh, the thing I'm going to use in 2022 is, let me, da, da, da. can I share, is this going to work? Let's find out. Oh, there we go. Um, so these are paradox cards, um, which I don't know. What are they? So I think from memory they're Belgian. <clears throat> um, and the essentially what they are are lots of cards with paradoxes on them. And so you go, <gasps> is it this or is it this? Or is it both? Or is it whatever else? Ooh, oh, nice. I, I feel nice. money flowing out. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's so <tired. laughs> Right. Um, and the reason is, um, and actually, I think Lisa was involved in some of the, these Twitter conversations um, of Web3 metaverse crypto. Um, I'm I mean, it's right in my wheelhouse, right? It's kind of like you go, it's, it's all sorts of, um, it's economics, it's communities, it's um, decentralized things and so on. But it is also simultaneously the most scammy horrible thing i've ever seen in my life um and so they're sort of like just having a continual deck of cards to go sort of like what is this and keep dealing out things and, and have some perspectives you can continually flip around um i think it's going to be very useful just because yeah yeah all sorts of reasons wait are the are the um visuals are they geometric is it geometrical shapes yeah, so if I go... Because I was like, yeah, so all of them are like that. It's just like um, having different forms and configurations or something. Sometimes. Um, Sometimes, yeah. so, okay. oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it's... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Interesting. Yeah. Take my money. They're really <laughs> nicely designed. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so are they paradoxes or are they opposites? Are they paradox? Um, well, I suppose like you, why would they be called paradox cards? I don't know, because it's funny because it's uh, 2022, so it's catch 22 year. There you go. As we try to solve problems, you encounter paradoxes all the time. Ugh. Blame CERN, blame CERN. These cards will help <laughs> you discover paradoxes. Okay. Apparently. Because they call them paradoxes, does that That's make funny. them paradoxes? Yeah, this, this well, is because we can, you know, can charge what, what's more. ironic and does Alanis Morissette get yeah, to exactly? Design? There's a whole. I mean, there's there's kind of like an instruction sheet which I've never opened. I mean, I don't mean to start an argument with your card deck, but. Maybe opposites cards was already taken. Well, I think like Liesl was saying, sorry, go on, go on, go on, Liesl. 
I was just going to say, you can charge more for paradox than you can for an opposite. It's just branding, basic brand. <laughs> And it sounds paradox, harder. It, so, it sounds exactly fifty dollars harder. <laughs> <laughs> they look beautiful, though. Yeah. Oh yeah, they are. You have to wait a while for them because I think it's sort of like it's it's on Design Studio's side project, as all these things are. Um, and so it's like it gets posted when they get round to posting it. They've, they've got a web shop that involves you have to email them before you can buy anything, which is quite delightful. Yeah. So yes, I'm going, to dis- like I'm going to discover what I'm going. I'm going. To, I'm going to spend 2022 discovering whether paradoxes in this deck are indeed paradoxes at yeah. all. But yeah, I mean, it's also funny because like yeah, all the more reason Wilshire, like you know, is it a Hoovian year? Is that what's happening? Ooh, time and space continuum. <laughs> yeah, Synchronicity really paradox. Yeah. <laughs> I was. I have to say, I, I was. I was underwhelmed by the latest Doctor Who thing. It was kind of like I was. I was wanting it to be much better than it was, and it was like, oh, oh, oh. So, who should we tag? Who's got? Who else, who else has got something? Right. Not everyone has to have something. We can just generally chat about things. But who's got? A thing? True. I'll, I'll I'll go next because what I have to share kind of follows what you just shared with the paradox cards. So, just a little. Or does I it? Share, you know, or does it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is not what I brought to share, but I just wanted to mention it. So I've, I bought the method kit, one of their, their cards that's focused specifically on, well, I'll just pull it out. The idea of this particular method kit is they've identified a bunch of, um, I don't know, I'm not, attentions, I guess. So like, here's one profitable, let me go mess with this stupid camera here. Uh, <clears throat> bring things into focus, there we go. Like profitable, unprofitable, right? Or let's see, what's this one say? You guys can read, it's backwards for me. Rights protected, open source, right? So it's a whole deck of tensions like this. And the idea is, this is not an autofocus lens, so I apologize. Um, the whole idea is that uh, you just pull out the pair of these and you put them on the matrix. And now you have your tensions that you can plot on the grid. So similar to paradoxes, not quite the same. <clears throat> John, I think you turned me onto the Paradox uh, card deck and yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Um, yeah, and, and, and definitely we'll take your money. Um, the card, the deck I was gonna share, and again, I apologize for the autofocus stuff, but, um, or lack thereof. So I don't know if it's meaningful in 2022, but uh, a little context first. I'm really interested in the patterns behind cards and how we use use those. And I don't feel like um, I've come across much literature talking about that. Um, just the the patterns, and whether it's games or knowledge cards. And uh, so one of my projects in 2022 that I'm working on is to create a sort of a documentation site where I try to talk about ways we can arrange cards, you know, the ways we use suits, the way we can display cards, the way we can rotate cards, the way we can flip cards and start talking about patterns of use. And one of the cards I, decks I just ordered was um, Ron Plouffe's uh, Proverb Construction Kit. Just came across it on Amazon. Um, <clears throat> but what struck me when I pulled out the box to look at it was uh, just the way it uses suits. And so there's basically three different uh, uh, three different ty- sets of types of cards. There's the, not, I can't remember the sequence here. Yeah, there's the function card. And this is like a header. So you'd lay it on the table and put this as a header. There's the frame card. And there's the fiction card. And Ooh, then- Sorry, I'm loving the alliterative. I love the Fs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and again, it's proper <laughs> construction kit. So then you go through, and this is the part that struck me is there are exactly three cards that go along with, the frame card and they're numbered one, two, three. And on the back, it says function one, two, three. So there's kind of a key there. Um, and then when you get to the frame cards, there are one, two, three, four, five, right? That you can add, I think the idea is you pick one or you pick the relevant ones. And then when you get to the finished cards, there is like, I don't know, another 10 or 11 of those that you can, you can do. And the idea is you would, I think there's a picture on the back of the card box, you would spread them out and you could see the, different types. Um, what struck me about it was normally when I think of suits, like suits of cards, I always think of equal number or rough parity in between things. I don't know why, like it, when you think about it intentionally, it doesn't make sense why 
a suit should have equal card, equal number of cards, except that mm -hmm. playing cards do, right? And I think that's where this invisible artificial functional fixedness comes from. And so just pulling out of the box and like, oh yeah, a suit could have one or two cards and another suit could have 20. That's okay, right? If that's yeah. So I, that no, was just that's great. <laughs> um we have to plug you if it's you, you, know, you have to plug you to um good old Mr. Um, Andrew McLuhan who's sorting out his um, four suits, but that's a great insight that just because it's a different suit doesn't mean it has, everything has to be the equal, equal. amount, like, yeah. And um, yeah, we were talking to um, Nick, who's obviously going to watch this now, Nick Kellett, um, was asking what um, a, a, what number for like a perfect or at least ideal deck of cards. And I didn't know she suggested that um, it would be a 12 and a 20 or a 12 and 22. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, that's really nice that we, you know, it's a construct that we're like, oh no, all of the suits must be equal rather than a no. No, <laughs> so it's interesting. We, we got bought um, uh, a new card game called Sky Joe, which is a, um, it's just a numbers based game. And you basically, every player has to be able to, the competition is to get as low a score as possible. And there's kind of jeopardy at various stages. And there's a lot of um, trade offs of random turns of cards it's really nice it's quite simple but the two things about it first of all i don't know if there's an equal distribution of the cards or not and it's an interesting thing because it actually would make quite a material difference to how you played it but i can't be bothered to go through all of the cards to work out or not so like are the extremes more common than than <clears throat> other ones or are the ones in the middle? who knows um but the other thing is in terms of that how many cards is an ideal pack size I don't know how many cards there are, but it feels like it's about 150, maybe even 200. And that's a real problem because it's, in, yeah, it's, it's that much and you can't shuffle it. So you had to put, split it into two groups and sh or three groups and shuffle it. So the limitations of the card deck for me are things about the practicality of it. If you need to shuffle them, 50 odd cards is okay. Smaller than that, you get to a point where you can't randomize it very easily and 200 is way too many. But also if you start to get into the realm of, digital cards and you start to break some of those conditions as well and i know that there might in this group be heresy to the idea of cards that aren't card but then you get into some really interesting things because actually the practicality of cards has been determined by the physical attributes of what they're needing to be done in the physical world and if you could digitally sort them shuffle them you could have a million cards which you <clears throat> can never do with your hands but they they should have the numbers seven or nine somehow manifesting within that <laughs> because that's good luck in Asia and there's your market right there Oops. Um, seven's lucky number nine's a lucky number you're gonna say I haven't actually counted how many this is so whilst you're talking I'll just remind you just remind you I'm gonna oh can we bet I reckon 48 I, okay oh, god it's more, more games upon games <laughs> so that's the uh that's the Oh no! Actually, go no. on. Uh, could you? No, could, no, no. Uh, could, could you est Could you estimate the GSM card stock? Um, we'll talk, yeah, talk it on the chat. But I'm gonna <laughs> carry on, four, Lisa. I'm, I'm just. It's a four hundred. It's clearly going to be forty-two. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me. Just watching Rena. Rena <laughs> Dilma. <laughs> Stop this right thing. I'm trying to twist. Count, like, please twist. Care, Twist, I twist. <laughs> Don't anyone say any numbers now. Any numbers whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> oh. To the internet, so I looked it up. What was that? 57. 57. 57, though. I mean, that's... Oh, you've got quite a small hands, though, haven't you? I was, wasn't taking that into account when I was doing my No, 57 cards. Yeah. Maybe it's the hexagonal nature of it. So I don't know what the mathematics is of if you have to do a no, flower it's, spread. It's it's the underlying math. So I looked at um, fifty seven a while ago. There's I think it's fifty seven. I think the smaller number that fits the same algorithm is something like thirty three. Oh, so for the of so course for the pictures. Yeah, so that yeah. the mass the mass <clears> length, <throat> what choice you can have. You're you're a bit quiet, Nick. Have you got a volume? Oh. You Oh, is, yeah. is your is your mic above your head? <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Jeez, <Yeah>. first time <laughs> this year. That's, that'll be better then.
What it's what, what talking amateur? at the top of it? Yeah, or talking at the top of my head would have been would have worked as well. It's wheel mode. <laughs> Chris, did you have a set of things you were waving around in a luxury case earlier? Well, I was actually waving around a case. Ah. Uh-huh. Um, which was just so this my thing with this is because I'm quite new to well, I've been using cards for things and playing games with cards and fascinated by it and for a long time, but I'm quite new to sort of trying to do what I think all of you do to a, 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 in certain ways. And I um I actually, before I first spoke to John, I bought some artifact cards, which sadly got um, uh, there was a, a minor leak in the lo- in the lockers in my co-working space, and uh, and most of my I came back about a week later, and most of my artifact cards were warped, so I've heresy got some blank ones. But this is a 1970s Polish bridge case that I picked up. Oh. If you go looking for bridge sets on eBay, they basically sell leather there's lots of this is this one's produced by the polish leather industry standardized thing in the 70s and is that a I was, book <laughs> no that's the, 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 the bread, yeah. that's the that's the bridge scoring oh, so you bridge just switch scoring. that out with your own and i just thought for any of you uh you know, if you are actually going back to doing stuff at irl the the equivalent of john's very <laughs> nice ca- above head camera would be to sort of you turn off and you're just like well let's get the deck out Pull it out in your little. There we go. Yeah. Um, I. I mean, I got into one of my. Um, I had a, an intern in the summer. He's one of my, one of my former students, who is who, who. Um, he he got his 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 had his magic circle, um, uh, final interviews around the time that he was working for me, um, and uh, he's he was like one <coughs> of the first people to be added to magic circle after the pandemic when they were allowed to go back to do it in person. He's a so he was and he became a member as soon as he could after his 18th birthday and he's like a member of the junior magic so all this kind of thing and, and he was explaining to me the card dynamics of the differences between magic and cardistry and how magicians consider cardistry to be a bit heretical because it's so much focused on the and he and he's just this phenomenal the thing the way he handles a deck of cards and he's telling me that magicians buy magicians buy their cards from the same sort stop me if you all know this the standard deck of cards used by most magicians is the same as the standard deck of cards used in the best casinos other than um, you know customized ones but magicians buy them cheaper because to buy what they call a brick of cards which is a certain number of cards they they, it's a standard size piece um if you're buying them as a um um you're all magicians okay uh, that includes you, you, Chris. <laughs> uh, it's just like, okay, right. So it's just, I really, I was like, I'm so thanks. I, that's why it's funny. It's just okay, like, right. uh, <laughs> he, uh, yeah, he was explaining to me that the only difference between the cards sold bought by magicians, which are for a lower price, unit price, <laughs> and, the, um, and the ones bought by casinos, is the is the um, quality control on them because the the casinos just want to be able to open them and know that they're perfect and be able to put, basically put money behind that. Whereas magicians will open a deck and check them themselves. And so they pay a lower price for the same thing, just in case they've got anyway. So um, you talked about, okay. The, uh... No, it's, it's, I'd say it's, it's uncanny because that thread continues to what you okay. just mentioned. So it's like, it's like you were, you're, 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 I was meant to be here. I was well, meant no. to join the magicians. <laughs> yeah, but, but anyway, said, so yeah. my main thing is to have to be able to go in person, and I've got blank cards in here, and to go and try these out with people. Um, and I just rather like the packs. So that was all I wanted to share. Cool. Thank you. Anyone else got something? Indy. So um, I don't know. This is not that interesting to look uh, right now. Very much. To, this is my sort of. Uh, Prototype beginning, um, I'm making a card deck for project managers who are in the middle of doing projects. And basically the idea is the back is really simple, sort of, you know, the word questions, who, why, where, what. And the front is um, gonna be issues to do with um, 
to do with projects and why projects fail, because basically uh, in project management, um, at the end you're right, varies between sectors, but across sectors is basically just constant. Like, you know, a million things have been done and project management techniques have improved and stuff, and, but like failure rates still stay the same. And <clears throat> I think one of the reasons is, is about mindfulness. And so I think the idea behind the cards is just, um, you know, to put some issues on the cards and uh, the idea would be that every day you pick out a card on one front, so that's an issue. Someone wants to stop part of this project and then, you know, maybe the back one from the back side is like where, and just to put issues into the brain every day to um, sort of um, stimulate scanning, because that's really one of the hard uh, things that inside project management is is sort of two activities one is like this sort of really detailed management thing of keeping track of everything and then there's this horizon scanning and horizon scanning is the thing i think about a lot um so yeah i'm working on that um it's not very exciting to look at right now but there's something interesting about that though in and it's similar mm. similar principles i think to some of the stuff i'm doing the priorities cards about um just being able to have random input to be able to say is this something you need to be thinking about at the moment or is this a problem at the moment and the, the randomness of it is powerful but there's also something I, I, the, the other thing that i've been working on which is the play cards which have been going for a while now um and i did a session with some technology people a few months back and just sort of highlight to the fact I was, I was first of all I asked them to each draw a card and then commit before they drew, drew it to act upon what the card told them to do um, which is a fairly ludicrous thing where you've got a complete stranger coming in and handing you something and then telling you to act on a random act of selection but we do it all the time in many ways with things like gambling or well particularly things like gambling actually. Okay, on the um, gambling note before you said that my mind was it's like my mind was talk, thinking about Texas Hold'em and then you said gambling. Yeah. So for both you and Indy, because I was just thinking of layouts, because they're quite heady, you know, like textures instead of what if you had like, as in Texas Hold'em, you as a facilitator have the, um, the shared deck and then you, they have like their own hand and then they can do this like, uh, I don't know, right, facilitator. Or what's in your hand, Mr. Project Manager or boss or something? Mm. But on the table, as you lay it out, then they have to kind of make that match. So it's a, it, there's this sense of collective individuation. Just another uh, and, and theme even, for, for, for the year ahead, I think. Yeah. yeah, but even that, then being able to say, right, okay, you need to get a set of three cards or five cards. There's some in the middle. Draw out until you're happy with a set of three cards that you will then yeah. act on. Mm. Yeah, those kind of ideas I think are quite interesting. Yeah. And you know, why did you give that one up? Why did you give this one back? Why why do you want him to have that one? <clears throat> yeah. So at, at least because by having the Texas Hold'em and having these conversations, people can also see the the strategies, the thinking about like, oh, that's not how I would have played it, but interesting. So and and to facilitate, but again, more um, suggesting tips. Mm -hmm. So, cool. There's yeah, I'd love to see that in a workshop now, like a Texas Hold'em, but with thoughts. Wow. <laughs> right, or with any of the cards, really, even with um, uh, Stephen's um, Proverbs one, yeah. Streeing into what Mark's just described. We have to test it. We have to play Texas Hold'em in person at the next meet. Real meet, maybe. Real meet up. A real meet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come on, John. We have to kind of, yeah. So London, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come and meet in London whenever Southern Trains put trains back on to London, because at the moment you can't go to Victoria, which is nice. Um, the Just on, on Matt's thing, there's, sort of like the, there's something about that, and, the, and the, the, to Indies as well, someone comes in and tells you how to play the game, and I don't know where this is going, but imagine a situation in which you just like go in and you put a pile of cards in the middle of the table and go, I'm going to tell you how to play the game. There's just a pile of cards in the middle of the table. What would you do? And just to sort of like to then almost have a kind of like a, a layer of meta analysis about how a group decides what the game is, how they're going to play, how many cards they should take, 
what order they play in, what good looks like, what bad looks like. So almost like you just have the material and then you're going, like, okay, so we're going to analyze not just the, the way that you play and the things that you decided, whatever else and so on, but then you, how you decided that amongst yourselves. So that reminds me, there's a game <clears throat> called uh, Banga, which some of you may have heard of, um, which was designed to highlight um, the difficulties of cross-cultural communication. And basically uh, you get groups with ordinary playing cards and they each get an instruction sheet about how to play the game. And then- after What was it so called, many, sorry, uh, Indy? I'll put it in the chat. Sorry, thanks. Uh, after so many minutes, uh, people move to different tables. And, and of course, sorry, I should say, the trick is they're not allowed to talk. And when you arrive at a new table, uh, no, the instruction sheets are put away. So the people who stay carry on playing the game. But of course, the trick is every table has <clears> a different <throat> set of instructions. So you arrive at a table with, and discover, usually in a painful way, that there's a new set of rules there that you didn't know about. There's something quite nice as well about, oh. um, I did a, um, uh, a Lego game um, where tables would be split out and they were, everybody was given the same instruction and told that it was a collaborative exercise. It would produce as many ideas as possible. Um, but then individual uh, groups were given conflicting sub-objectives. So some groups were told that they could only use red Lego bricks, and of course, I didn't give them any leg any red Lego bricks, so they had to go and negotiate with another group about what they were doing. Another group was told that they couldn't tell anybody to anything. Another was told that their main job was to share as many ideas with everybody else as possible. And <clears> I can't remember the other ones, but but when you then get people playing ostensibly the same game, but actually with some different constraints, even though at the beginning they've been told you're all here to deliver, the collective goal here is to come up with as many ideas as possible as an entire group and as a way of being able to help people understand how it doesn't take much for um, silos to emerge and for com competition to exist where it's been explicitly told not to and how you get fighting and I mean it's completely engineered by me it's great fun because you could immediately see how you know different groups are there but the same game with different rules playing at the same time is really interesting just to pick up on something Matt said earlier about um, the sort of power of randomness, I think one of the things about, you know, think about my project and project management, you know, project management techniques are basically this enormous checklist of here's the th all the things that you should pay attention to all the time. And uh, it doesn't work in part because it's just too much for anybody to pay attention to all this all the time. Like, you know, and there's a whole other discussion about how we break up work and stuff. But one of the values of randomness is just a way to access some parts of that. But, you know, you know, and if you do it regularly, you get some coverage. And that might apply to some other things as well. Game you mentioned, Matt, do you... I mean, do you or do you any of you run those kind of committee games a lot? Is that I know that format as committee games where you've got sort of an overall aim, but lots of at least one aim per team or per player? So that game I did, I did run it quite a few times. I haven't done for a few years, but it was explicitly as a starting point to get people to start to think about what collaboration meant. And so the aim was for it to be destructive to the the overall group to be able to get people to think about actually when you're then back in work in a job we find that we focus on our immediate near-term objectives and small team objectives rather than the overall organization objectives and often that's because organizations set it up that way they set up stupid things that make people backstab and fight against each other but yeah i mean i've Sorry, I've, I've been involved in war games and mega games that taught me that like uh, and like role play this uh situation like a counter-terrorism situation but you you want to find the terrorists mm -hmm. but you want your team to find the terrorists rather than any others so you want to help but you want you you should come out best in this that kind of thing um and to me 
especially thinking of employers I've worked for, that made a that explained a lot how poorly they were those organizations were designed and managed. So committee what what I think what is known as committee games to me is is really useful for illustrating that in a business context. But then when I sort of look around for people doing that, it seems that um, just those kind of games, either for entertainment purposes or for business gaming purposes, just don't exist or aren't used a lot, apart from what you said. So I don't know if either, it's one of those situations where you don't know if you've not used the right term or done enough research. And as soon as you learn the right term, you'll see the 20 companies that are doing this, or whether there's something, what, something that I think is obvious that something is being missed. The... I, I want to ask. Yeah, I want to ask John before you just uh, yeah. say that. Just to add, add, just add another question of it is, yeah. Can can everyone here? I don't know. Just make it more apparent of which companies do you know or clients are definitely doing these committee games because even with the lawyers that we're working with at the moment on horizon scanning, the using cards or gameplay is still just not part of their business playbook it just isn't um it's just pdfs and powerpoints uh which are just bigger cards but um yeah so it just would be nice to know who's really doing this because um there's this gap it seems between us creative folk and intellectual folk and playful ones and then the few that want to dip into that but the serious when i say serious they're their jobs have impact in terms of law or policy um, and they're not doing this. Um, and then you get the generals who war game all the bloody time with their maps and their, you know, what I can only imagine is like some sort of incredible digitized war room in the movies anyway. I don't know if that happens still in person, but I know I'm, I'm asking that serious question because given the meta crises that ha have been happening and how we need to just socks up, sleeves up, sort it out from this year, you know, less panic. And like, yeah, we've got work to get on with and how we can, again, as magicians or like legitimately, legitimately say, right, you know, DLA Piper, senior, you know, clients and, you know, you're going to charge us however much amount. This is how we get decision making done. Not hypothesizing, not more pointless meandering conversations, interaction, decision-making, insights in three hours. I wonder if it's not so much entire organisations, but there are little Teams. kind of horizontal threads in different types of profession that use it. So I can think of, you know, very specific things like planning poker within agile methods. I can think of within, it's in my IT kind of world, um, there was lots of simulation game stuff early on in the world of ITIL, the, the, um, the systems management uh, methodologies, uh, things like Six Sigma and those kind of things, I think, use simulation games as well. But they're these kind of, to a method, there's some games associated with them that might be card games or, or similar. I don't know that I've ever come across an organisation where this is a, a culture that exists throughout. No, it's a, it's, it's, a it's a special event thing. The, the thing I was going to say is, well, actually, the, the, on, on Nick's interject, interjection, sort of, the, the, the wargaming versus cards, for instance, is sort of, that's, we did the, a, a deck called Future, which I think you've seen, um, which is basically to take people out of big, long setup wargame things, go, we we'll have to think very carefully about the setup. It's just about constant, no, 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 the sort of like the keep playing hands, the thing we liken to say, stop playing risk and start playing poker. Just deal mm -hmm. a hand, then deal a hand, then deal a hand. None of them are related, apart from the fact that it's like your skills and intuiting how they might connect get better. The question, the bigger question I wonder is to, to Matt's point about um, setting up games where you're trying to make the organization fail because you're gonna, I'm gonna show you why you're not cooperating and so on, et cetera. So it's almost like there's no conditions set up within that game where they're going to succeed. I wonder if it's, there's also space to say, this is a game that is eminently winnable. And the point is to find the smallest tweak you can make within your organization to make all of your games winnable. Rather than just saying, sort of like, we don't cooperate at all, it's actually, do you know what? If we just had more visibility on this thing from every team, we'd win. Mm. Just this one thing. If we just yeah. did this one, so rather than sort of like reimagining all of the organization stuff, you go, what's the one thing yeah. that you can walk out of this room 
and promise to do more of. Yeah. Mm, maybe we need a little treatise or a symposium. Ah. Yeah. No, I, I honestly, we all need to get, you know, we have our jobs and get paid consultancy, but sometimes as with the arts collectives, you kind of need a movement where, right, we're going to launch a futurist manifesto. I'm not saying we do that, but a much better kind of the cardstock folk so that we say, hey, 2022, <laughs> metric crises and all that. Because well, to, to the metaphor of the, of the Texas Hold'em thing, with a lot of, you know, um, I can't stand this indecision married with a lack of vision. Everybody wants to rule the world, but, you know, incompetently yeah. at the moment. Lisa, um, Lisa wants to come in, be quick. Yeah, go on. Lisa, um, yeah, it's just more, um, people want to win, but they don't want to play the hands. It's just like this round, we just need to make an action and decision rather than, oh, I, I, I'm not going to play because I don't know if I'm going to win after 20 hands. Mm -hmm. They haven't even played two. Lisa. Lisa. With an Liesl, L. Liesl, Liesl, yeah. Liesl. Yes. Lots of stuff. Yeah. Hey, you, hey, you all works. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, it's sort of thinking about what everyone's saying. Um, I just wanted to non tangentially, actually, in a very connected way, say what I've been thinking about at the beginning of this year. And my whole thinking about the beginning of this year has been around I've been working with a lot of startups and I'm working with a lot of startups who are both tech, but also in the creator space which makes it sound web3 metaverse and it's not it starts off very much in things like band merchandise and and tartan and 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 drinks and all sorts of stuff um but they're all startups and they all work in a very certain way so my experience of just joining the card people as i call you people the card people was i went out and splashed loads of cash and all the method kits and a lot of them and what I found is that entrepreneurs freaking love them because they've got no time they're thinking about a gazillion things and when you put things in their hands and let give them the chance to give them instructions or talk to them about what you're going to do with them in order to solve particular problems that I'm working with them on they love it just the whole being able to organize it and see it in that way is just really powerful and they come up with patterns and ideas and usage, use, use, uses themselves, which actually teaches me and I use moha because that's what consultants do. We take strip from one client and then we sell it to another. Um, and that was interesting, I thought. But the other thing that um, I've been first, I'm in Spain right now and my husband and I have been going really old school. We've been playing cards and I've been playing patience and pelmanism, which I used to play with my grandmother and I think there's like a nostalgia element to it. There's also a let's do something that's not digital element to it. And we've been having fun with it and dealing ourselves really unusual um, ways, that, like different numbers of cards and different, different changing the rules for fun because that's how we are. And that's been really quite fun just to go back to a basic pack of cards and throw away the rules and say, we're gonna make up games. So that's been fun. But the thing I'm working on this year is, if I can get it right, is like frame of ref. I can't do it. Frame of reference. That's my thing for this year. Is frame of reference. And the reason is because people like us have huge frames of reference. I think everybody here probably has a larger set of frames of reference, and each of those are probably larger in many ways than your average person. But also I've noticed in problem solving, people struggle with the big and the small frames of reference. We know you're talking about stuff like political change, which I'm very much into and I work on some of that. If you're gonna solve environmental crises, you have to enlarge your frame of reference and look at all the really good shit that they're doing in the Philippines or Japan or Thailand, you know, places where we, we normally live. Um, and actually expand the frame of reference in order to generate potential solutions and ideas that might solve big complex problems. But then if you actually want to get shit done, you have to bring the frame of reference in again in order to make it kind of like size of the manageable. And I'm thinking about that. I can't do it. I'm really, some of become really 
Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you, Matt and John. Bravo, Benny. Um, that, sorry, I'm in Spain. I'm getting old. Italian. <laughs> all out of it. Yeah, Italian. I know. Like, that Latino what? vibe, yeah. Um, I'm getting my whole like energy vibe on gesticulation. Um, but there's, I think there's something about zooming in and zooming out in a frame of reference that I'm working on um, in my own practice um, this year. And I'm thinking about the cards. Is that is that a card? Type? And how does that? I don't know. Is there a card? I don't know. Mm, yeah. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Cut, cut a hole in the middle of the card. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, John has such a card. Actually, he has a perfect card with a before, with yeah. a with a window in it. Bring oh, it out. Come to be able to join in at the end, so he can say hello <laughs> to himself at the end <laughs> of the recording. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. Yeah. Liesl, there you go. What is there? Yeah, yeah. What is, I need. Is. We need a. We need an expandable and 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 retractable one. You just move it in or out. That's also true. I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> Before anybody ever like, leaves, I want to just really put this in as like task. Um, John, it is about time. There have been several card stocks and the um, existential urgency of the issues we want to help in and and kind of do. I think each card stock member needs to write a short mini essay. And like if if we were a card, like you know, like a what is the card stock deck? Uh, uh yeah, what is the card stock deck? So this is Liesel, this is Indy. Face, a little bit of a treatise, then a little book, and then in rotation to do. Seriously, I mean it just has to be done. It's uh really? we have mold enough. Like this is how we operate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So, um, uh, a cardstock playbook, like really. A card stick, a cardstock card deck. Yeah, a cardstock deck. Book. Stick with deck the book. metaphor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> but I, I'm offering it up, like the my yeah. I think we really should. I think that's. I think yeah, that's, really good. I think that's a very a, good idea. Yeah. I want to just show something back on what I was drawing while Lisa was talking there. So let me just. Uh, Hang on, no, I don't know how to use this. Da, da, da. I'll just do it on here at the moment. So perspective, and this goes back to something Stephen dropped in about sort of like cards, the bite-sized units of information, that are like the atomic, the atomic bit of information. Um, perspective, frame of reference, is this sort of like so? I've been sort of like for the last year and a half, I've been sort of like obsessed with this idea that information is light, not liquid. And the way, if we keep thinking of it as light as individual pieces of pixels of information or whatever else and so on, you can start thinking about it in terms of, okay, so, so your frame of reference here is different from my frame of reference here. We might be looking at it the same stuff, but we are looking at it from different angles and with different contexts and in different places and so on and so forth. So this is a way of thinking about information starts to become, all right, so that's why Kardec's are in one are one of the interesting things for me because you're going recording in progress. Woo! I am recording it, Nick. Don't worry, it's being recorded. You have to record it. It's like a delay pedal. Um the so yeah this 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 for me is a kind of it's a card deck that are kind of like you go every time I deal a different card or when you're talking about the people laying out the things on them ta on the table for themselves is the sort of like that has become the frame of reference but all of these individual pieces of information can be dealt into a new frame of reference again and again and again and again so yeah I I uh, yes basically yes 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 that frame of reference thing I think is really important and critical yeah i mean it, even it boils down to simple things like language as well i mean i speak four languages and i'm sure lots of people here speak languages and just it just expands your frame of reference so much when you speak another language yeah um also reading books i was having a what's his name who's the guy who does all the um who's the guy who does the ibm storyteller uh connell white thingy oh, the yeah. guy who Chief storyteller for IBM, extraordinary guy, Jeremy Connell White, really interesting guy. Um, and we were having a we were having a chat on LinkedIn, and he was saying what his best books of last year, and everybody was boasting on LinkedIn of these fantastic business books that we're reading. And I was like, not enough fiction, guys. 
where's the fiction of poetry? And he was like, do you know what? You're right. Can you recommend books? One of the books I recommended was Luck and Booth. I recommended a few other books and some poetry because your frame of reference needs to be expanded. You're only reading certain kinds of, of, of stuff. And again, it's a clan thing. You know, we're a clan mm -hmm. here. Yes, there's a lot of, I noticed when I mentioned Gormenghast, I noticed John nodding and I thought that's a very kind of like, I bet you there's a lot of people here who do know quite a lot about Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, you know, like, I don't, I'm not, but I, that, but because you hang around in the same clans, because you go to the same places, because you, you think you're being really expansive in your frame of reference, but actually what you're doing is you're playing in the same damn sandpit all the time. And you need to get out of that sandpit sometimes and either play in a bigger one or play in a different one. But but it needs to expand and, 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 and you know, it's not always about expansion. It can also be about having a deeper dive and a deeper look into something which is a smaller frame, which is a diversify your network for sure. That for sure. And the thing about and, and that being able to get those different reference points in is yeah, yeah hugely. And that's why this whole diversity of thought thing with, you know, diversity of recruitment and stuff as well is, is, is really interesting. But, but just this, this idea of having frames of reference of being able to say, oh, I actually saw this work in another client and mm -hmm. I can see that it might apply in a different product category. That's about your frame of reference. Or this works in Asia. How could that translate to here or whatever? That's about a frame of reference or, you know, I somebody studied maths I didn't but some of you guys here are really good in you know and, and you can apply some of those things so how do you look at that when you're trying to help people solve problems whether they're oral problems political problems commercial problems interpersonal problems like how do you use the frame of reference as a way of enabling better outcomes really is my is my jam C'est mon trip en français. C'est mon trip cette année. C'est mon trip. Ah, oh, bravissima. I, I, I speak English and barely. Stop it, you put me to shame. <laughs> I'll tell you what, learning to speak an Asian language blew my mind, especially one which has 66 letters in it and 22 freaking vowels. That's Thai. It's like, why do you need so many vowels? Um, but just the way the way it's constructed and everything, I thought you speak European language. I thought I got this. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> it was a thing. It's hard, but it really changes the way you think about things because the way ideas and thoughts are constructed in other languages is is, is critical to how people think. Mm. Thai, by the way, is an Indian written language, but a Chinese spoken language. So it's a little bit of a a mix of things. Bali and Sanskrit is what it, the written language comes from, but it has five tones, which is like, tones is like, wow. Um, but then that's me, I'm a bit of a language, so, yeah. I, I was just Lisa, you're amazing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I was thinking about the, you know, when you talk about frame of reference, I kind of thought of, I have a, I have a model obsession. Like I love just the different quadrants um different ways of like analyzing things or different ways of approaching things and there's so many different quadrants out there different models that people have put together quadrants. and it's just like i've always wanted i've always fancied the idea of putting together a deck of models or ways to helping people frame things is just a really important skill that people just don't have and <clears throat> like it's really weird you come to this group and this group thinks differently so it's kind of like it's cool to be here because you can have these conversations which are not everyday conversations everywhere, right? And also you don't get punished for, for having a frame of reference. Like sometimes, especially as a woman, Rena backed me up here. Sometimes you feel like you're pushed back a little bit, like, or like you're not supposed to know shit. Like you've got, you're allowed to know so much and you're not allowed to know anymore. Um, and that's the, the difficulty is in getting people to feel comfortable with being uncomfortable with things, with, with new ideas, with new ways of doing things, with letting different people lead processes, with losing control sometimes is, is, right. is a hard skill to get 
for all that, so, so that's that's maybe if I go back to that, which I've now written frame of reference, I'm going to stick it in my board behind me. Oh, look, it's, oh, it's all darkened out behind it. That looks amazing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. does look like a magic trick. You've got to be that. Ooh, we're all magicians <laughs> now, Chris. Um, the what I was going to say is sort of like the, with your idea of frame of reference. I wonder if it is easier to say to people, look, just just take up someone else, just stand where someone else would be standing. Right? You can always walk back to where you stand. That's fine. You don't get punished for sort of like, you don't have to permanently shift from over here to over here. But just appreciate we're all standing in different places, looking at the same stuff, but from different angles. So you can always walk around something and see it from different perspectives and always go, if you're happiest standing where you're standing, you can always go back there. There's nothing lost. Great. Oh, John, yes. that perspex thing again. It's, imagine there's 20 of them. We all get one. Yeah. yeah. And then we write um, a whatever, something, a treatise. We collapse that into a book and some artifacts and play and, and we launch that. We need more creative renaissance resistance. And the only way to do that is sometimes to, as magicians, manifest it, create a sigil, oh, yeah. create a thing. I like a resistance Because at the moment, we're, we're secret. We're all like meeting, like shh, secret meeting once a month. Uh, and we kind of need to come out of the cave now and again and say, what's up? Like, hey, give us your money, give us your money. <laughs> and let us conjure. <laughs> And come up with some solutions because I don't know some clowns have been running the show and it's time to take uh, that uh, the, the 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 wand from the clowns and give it into hands of magicians again. Magician, magician stuff like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. <Ooh. laughs> so, John, is that what something you made? Yeah. So I, I made it. I made it for um, the innovation and future thinking oh, wow. from Barcelona. So that is so cool. Because literally you can take that anywhere and just it changes based on where you are, right? It's exactly. So it's, it's basically, it's a, it's a field tool. So um, my friend Natalie Kane came and talked uh, on the course I run in Barcelona. And she had these list of questions. She, she works at the v and in the, the Rapid Response Digital Collection Unit. And so they have a series of questions because like, it's all like you have very, very short amounts of time to decide whether you're going to collect something for the V&A from the digital sphere, right? Because it could just disappear and you lose it forever. So they have a whole series of questions about how, like, how do we interrogate something to work out if it's something that you go in the collection. So, and it, it, this only started as a way to show the students what a laser cutter was. I said, right, we've taken some of Natalie's questions, right? We've put them on this, uh, this acrylic, but you can also use this as a field research tool to go out and look around the city. And I think we were doing the future of food that year. And it's basically just that you just go out and wander and you hold it in front of things and go, what is it? What is this food store? Where did it come from? Why is it here? What does it depend on? Who owns it? And so on. So it's just a way of making people think about the environment around them. And go, You can do that anytime. And like all the things like um, basically like artifact cards, like the dice, like those, whatever else, etc. I'm always trying to kind of like make things that, that are just MacGuffins. It's like it's Dumbo's feather. You go, you didn't need this to fly. Right, I've given you it to make you believe that you can, but you don't have to walk around the city with that and go, oh, well, I can't observe anything if I'm not carrying this. You go, <laughs> if you've not got it with you, you've not got it with you, right? But it's just, it's now fine. You now think in that way. It's the thing that gets you there in the first place. You know what it looks really like? It really looks like a card that you also use when you're trying to really look at a color and one side of it is white and the other side of it is black. Yep. And you look at a sample of color yeah, yeah, and you yeah, look yeah, at yeah. white and you look at it against black to get a really good idea of 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 the of the actual quality of that color. Yeah. So there's, there's it's it, yeah. It looks it looks just like that. Um I am I'm, 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 I'm gonna say um I, I know I'm 20 in. I'm I'm gonna yeah. call time in five minutes. Um, um, I'll tie it back then to how when we started and I took out two of these hex cards, right? Yeah. Um, the, and, uh, and then the, the sigil was two mirrors, <laughs> so frames of reference. And then with John, we need to release our own a scrying mirror, right? What is the future, which is looking glass, whatever, but you know, like the future. And people don't know how to future. When I say people, not 
in boardrooms, but our average neighbor, it's like, oh, you know, future is, you know, get married, wait for the news to tell me what to do, et cetera. But a deck to give the tools back into the hands of people to scry their own future, frames of reference, 57 ways. And maybe it starts, I don't know if, you know, we, maybe we don't get 57, John, but you definitely have at least 20 people from card stalkers to say, what's your frame of reference? I wish, I'll tell you what, I do wish I'd taken a, a I wish I'd taken a, a, <clears throat> a register and just known who'd been at them all. Um, but I haven't, because that's not- Well, I'm you doing. you have, an, they're probably on a newsletter, so you can remember again, <laughs> hey, call out for attendees of card stalkers. And um, yeah. Yeah. And then I think we can have a recollection of who was in the last few, but you know, we, and we have uh, Andrew McLuhan in there. I mean, it's time. I think right. it's, yeah, card deck. All right, so, card stock deck. so the, that is one of the 2022 projects. Um, yes, agreed. I'm, I'm very quickly going to show the thing that Stephen and I have started playing around with. Uh, is that right, Stephen? Oh, oh he's, he's on mute. Ah. I haven't seen it yet, so it'll be a first for me. All right, so basically, I don't know, I don't know. I'm still trying to remember how to use my computer. This is interesting. <laughs> John always gives me, you give me production value MV, John. I do what, sorry? You, you give me production value MV. You, you always do really good videos for things, and you always have your audio and your visuals set up really well, and you can always show what you're talking about, where I'm fiddling uh, around with stuff. So I, I have production value in. it's that well it's uh yeah i think it's because because my home office is like five years old and, and, and i've also been here for like 21 months quite a lot <laughs> i would time to think about that stuff um the so um what we're doing is we've just started so there's the me stephen uh christina and your other friend who's your other friend who is who stephen i forgot leticia leticia yeah she's at stanford both yeah so essentially what we're going to do is we're just saying that, oh we've probably got lots of card decks that overlap so we're just building a little card deck thing just to go let's see which card decks we have that overlap so i built this today because it's kind of like it's just back after christmas and it's like oh i, I meant to do that thing so essentially i've done a form which you can sort of look will just be like this the four of us are just going to play around with it for a bit, see how many we get to, see what things, at the moment all it is is uh, a name, who it's by, a photo, and who owns it, just so we can compare across. But then we can start adding things to it and go, right, so which, and maybe to, uh, to, it can be used as uh, something uh, for Stephen's card mechanics things, like which of the mechanics feature in these decks? And so therefore you can start filtering and say, show me all the things where there are four shoots, show me all the things where there are such and such and so on. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll have a wee play around this month, Stephen, with Christina and Leticia and go, is this a thing? And if it is a thing, we can start sort of like inviting more people in to contribute as well and then just publish it as a kind of like a resource. Stuff. Yeah, and where, and where it started from was um, Leticia is a new friend, acquaintance. Uh, she teaches at the D school and we were talking about the book she's working on that will come out in 2023. We got on the subject of card decks and uh, you know, I was sharing my library, she was sharing her library and there was some overlap but then differences. And she suggested, wouldn't it be great to do like a, uh, a competition to see who has more card decks? And the, the point being to, to burn our wallets and just, you know, learn all the identify all the gaps and cards we don't own already. And uh, I was like, yes, and I know someone else we need to loop in and that's John Wilshire because he runs this thing called the, the you know, Cardstock Meetup. Um, and then Christina <clears throat> Winky made sense as well because she also, we're bad for each other, books, card decks, games, will recommend something like, ah, now I gotta go buy it. So the idea was the four of us getting together to, to um, compare our card decks and then look for the gaps and 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 empty our wallets. I've now wondered about something else as well. Let me see if I can bring this up. Um, so uh, I re very recently switched from Rome to Obsidian, um, and there's a, a nice. Uh, oh, hang on, John. Jesus Christ! Share the right thing. There we go. Um, there's a nicer version of the uh, the nodal graph of all the bits of information. So I wonder if there's a way that we could kick the air table when it's connected through all the different things 
to say, okay, so what is uh, what do connect all these card decks? Where do they group? And so on and so forth. So once we get to sort of a, a certain amount of information, having something like this and go, all right, so card decks break into this kind of world and you see this lot over here which are similar and this lot over here that's are similar so that might be a nice thing i feel a deck of we should publish the deck of decks that would be useful <laughs> it's a deck. well i mean there is there's a a game called i said i was gonna end this didn't i i am gonna end this um the cool, th the cool thing about a deck of decks is it wouldn't actually infringe anyone's copyright because it'd just be like a cover shot yeah. Have seen, has anyone yeah. seen Meta Game? No. It's basically oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a huge I want, stack can of. Can I have cards a drone that scans your shelves, please? With lots of well, this is the this is the point of the air table. Basically, anything that's on the shelves will go into the air yeah. table just so that people can see. But basically, it's lots and lots and lots and lots of games across a set of different cards and lots of different cards, and you can have add-ons and so on. So it's lots and lots and lots of games <laughs> using the same cards. Anyway. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Done. I was like, I was just trying to ease my way back into work and now like the super scheme has landed with the FOR deck. I mean, like really though, it's hand and heart. Yeah. Pedal to the metal. We need to consolidate because otherwise the clown's gonna keep running the show. So right. Okay, well that's that sounds like a good start to the year then. Um we will lovely to uh, meet everyone again. Lovely to see you all. Happy New Year. See you all fourth Friday of the month at 4 p.m. Do we, do we need to meet more frequently if there's, if, if, that, <laughs> if, if uh, do we need a FOR subgroup? Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, raise How my... about pause and was it, and, and don't look now. Sit and Jorge, come se dice. Sit. And assess, <laughs> right? So right, right. very brainy hour and a half. Let's see what Simmer sit and assess and let it think um, when we get to it, because I think we will. And it's been heading to that its way. Look at the roster that not just this room, all the rooms, add McLuhan to that, who's the representation of Marshall McLuhan's ghost saying <laughs> it's time. And re no, seriously, I don't know how many people here have a deck of um, the distant early warning deck as well. We need to um, bring our God-given talents out of this room, which is brilliant, and um, give that tool to other people so that we can also have more allies and um, to clean up a lot of mess. And, you know, cleaning up is, and be creative, but people need to know how to clean up. On that note. <laughs> Good ending right. note. I'm going to stop the recording yeah. and a nice Zoom, a nice Zoom woman.